This morning we're going to be in Isaiah chapter, beginning in chapter 52, verse 13. So please open your Bibles to Isaiah 52, 13. It is the Christmas season, and we rightly should be celebrating the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that God came to earth and became a baby some 2,000 years ago is an amazing truth, and we should be in awe of the glory of that event. And that event had a purpose. Christ came into the world not simply to dwell with his people, but to go to the cross and die for his people. To stand in their place and to receive the punishment that they were due. During this season, we cannot forget that. And this morning, we get to remember that as we take the Lord's Supper. We remember his suffering and proclaim his death. And we remember this by taking a little cracker that reminds us of his body that was given. And we take a a little cup of juice that reminds us about his blood that was shed at the cross. During the season, we often read through various accounts of the Gospels in the New Testament that describe the events leading up to and including the birth of Jesus. These accounts tell us that Jesus will save his people from their sins, according to Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, and that he will be great and be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and there will be no end of his kingdom from Luke chapter 1, verses 32 and 33. These two passages tell us that Jesus will save and that Jesus will be king. And here in our passage in Isaiah, I want to draw attention to two descriptions of the Messiah. The Messiah as king and the Messiah as savior. These descriptions were written nearly 700 years before Jesus was even born. Only God, who reigns over history and creation, can supernaturally say something will come to pass and ensure that it does. Please follow along as I read. We're going to be in two different parts of this. I'm not going to reread the whole thing again. We'll be in Isaiah 52, verses 13 through 15, and then we'll jump down to Isaiah 53, verse 11. Please follow along as I read. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were appalled at you, my people. So his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For who, for what had not been told them, they will see and what they had not heard, they will understand. And then jumping down to verse 11. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge and the the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. This first description beginning in in chapter 52, verse 13, starts off with the word, behold. God is telling us to pay attention to what he is about to say concerning his servant. And then continuing in verse 13, God says that his servant will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. This description that God gives of his servant is a description that God reserves exclusively for himself. Throughout the book of Isaiah, God is the only one that is high and lifted up. He humbles and abases any that would presume to be lofty and exalted. He banishes and judges all false sovereignty and he alone will reign. He's telling us that this servant is God, and he will carry all his sovereign authority to reign as king. God also tells us that this exalted servant will purify many nations, and kings in shock submission will be speechless before him. The Messiah, the exalted servant, is Yahweh God. He will come and he will reign. However, there is a sharp contrast given between the glory and exaltation of the servant as king 
and the absolute humiliation and suffering of the servant as Savior. Chapter 53 provides the next description of the Messiah by detailing the suffering of God's servant. We're told that he was despised, forsaken, that he bore griefs, he carried sorrows, he was pierced for transgressions, he was crushed for iniquity, he was oppressed, afflicted, and he was killed. This servant suffered. He suffered to save his people from their sins. Look at the end of chapter 53, verse 11. My servant will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. This justification brings with it a courtroom imagery. This is a judicial clearing of charges. It's an acquittal. It's being declared not guilty. How, how does he do this? He does it by bearing iniquity, by taking the punishment that they deserve upon himself, by going in place of the sinner, by being their substitute. Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, fulfilled this prophecy 2,000 years ago and roughly 700 years after this verse was written when he was nailed to the cross and suffered and died in the place of his people. We know that no one is perfect. Everyone in this room and everyone on this planet is a sinner and has rebelled against a holy God. And for that rebellion, everyone has earned the wrath of God. And one day, coming soon, every individual in this room will stand before the judge. The question is, will you in your own defense stand by yourself? Or will you have Jesus intercede on your behalf? Those with Jesus are declared not guilty. Those without Jesus are declared guilty. This time of communion is for those that trust and believe in Jesus Christ. Those that joyfully submit their whole lives to him. Those that have turned from pursuing their own sin and turned to follow him. It's a time for believers to remember their savior. And if you would, by your own admission, say that you're not a follower of Christ, then when the tray comes, that, that you would just simply pass it by. We are glad that you're here and I'm glad that you get to hear these truths. But please consider that you will stand before the judge one day. And eternity hangs in the balance. Please come talk to me, talk to any one of the other pastors, come talk to the person who brought you. We would love to discuss what it means to be a follower of Christ. Believer. Jesus Christ is the king and he is the savior. He came 2,000 years ago to suffer on the cross on your behalf. And because he bore your sins, you are declared not guilty. And he rose again, and he's coming back to reign here on earth in his kingdom. Remember your king and savior and what he accomplished on the cross on your behalf. When your hearts are prepared, go ahead and take communion on your own. On your own. Men, please serve us.